Hi, I'm Roger Overby with Community Focus. Thank you for tuning in tonight. We got an important subject a lot of people haven't heard about, and that is an attack on the Fourth Amendment of our rights, our Bill of Rights in the state of Indiana. And that means like no knock, uh, police can come to your door and say, hey, I want to come in, look around, I got a uh, reason to think that you're doing something wrong or you have something that you're not supposed to have and this would take that away and say yes you can do that um, our founding fathers basically said the fourth amendment is something that protects you and your home and your privacy and the police without probable cause and or a search warrant cannot come into your house like that I've been involved in law enforcement most of my life, but believe me, this is an attack on our freedom, and it's something that I, most people in the law enforcement community, and obviously your average citizen, believes that shouldn't happen. Also, um, this is just, a lot of people didn't know about it. Some people have heard about it, but a lot of people haven't. So, we have our state representative here, Indiana District 34, Dennis Tyler and Dennis has been researching this and working on it and hopefully we can make this uh, <laughs> attack on our freedom go away. Dennis, how are you? Good, Roger. Thanks you're, for having me. Well, you're a familiar face in our studio yes. throughout the years and uh, you've been involved in labor. We have done shows back in the day. You've been involved in the uh, House of Representatives and yes, the sir. State House and uh, tell us about what's going on with this. Well, as you know, uh, the uh, Supreme Court uh, made a ruling earlier this year that mm -hmm. uh, uh, we had passed some legislation a number of years ago, a number of us had uh, signed off on to protect property owners and homeowners rights from search and illegal search and seizure. Uh, then there was a, a court case, Barnes versus the state, where uh, there was a search and seizure case on a domestic violence call that came through on 911. A lot of us believe that uh, the uh, Supreme Court has tremendously overreached on their rights on, on the, the way that they have uh, reacted to this, and that's why we're having summer study committee hearings on this at this time. Uh, I guess part of the, the gray area in it is, Roger, and you being a public safety officer and, and me being a public safety officer is, is the concern when a 911 call does come in that uh, speaks to domestic violence and that. Uh, do, you, do you just stay outside and if you're concerned that somebody is a victim of a, a domestic violence act or that and uh, not do something to try and, and uh, uh, remedy the situation in a, in a proper manner. Uh, we believe the Supreme Court has really overreacted on this and overreached. Uh, hopefully what we're going to get out of our summer study committee is we get this back into the, into the center someplace to where police officers can still do their job the way that they want to do it and the way that they need to do it without violating property owners and, and uh, uh, homeowners uh, rights on the, under the Fourth Amendment Act. And that's that's going to be a, uh, uh, there's uh, extremely strong beliefs on both sides. And uh, if you had the opportunity to view the, uh, the first hearing on it, you could see it was a very, very emotional hearing. And, and justifiably so, because you're talking about completely altering the intention of the Fourth Amendment. So it's, that, that's going to be a big issue as we move forward on that, is how do we strike the balance that we need to strike to still allow police officers and that to do their job, but still protect homeowners and property owners under the Fourth Amendment on search and seizure. As a lay person, I'm not an attorney and, I, and I'm not that involved in government sure. like you are, but to, to the people, if I understand this right, let's say this evolved around a um, domestic violence call. Yes. So in that sense, the police show up, if, if I understand this right, and they want to go in and check on people's safety and well-being, mm -hmm. and people are saying, no, you can't come in. Yeah. And they feel like, you know, I got probable cause to go in and check on people, which under most circumstances, they do. Right. And this has been taken beyond that to right. say, uh, if the law reads this way, to say, I think uh, John Doe's got something in his house he shouldn't have, 
Uh, they can't keep me out. I'm just going right. to knock on the door and go in right. and look around. Yeah, that's the overreaching unit. Right. Uh, I think you hit the nail on the head. You have a domestic violence call where, where you you're have a uh, probable cause of uh, domestic violence, a child or somebody else being hurt in there. Uh, you've got to be able to make a decision on what you think is, is best for, for the people that you represent and how to get in there and try to help them. The other side of that is, though, is exactly what you're talking about, and that's where they have really overreached. They didn't, they didn't put any definition into their, their ruling whatsoever, and uh, that's one of the reasons that a number of legislators, including myself, signed off on an amicus brief to ask them to reconsider their decision. Uh, if you know the Supreme Court very well, very seldom do they do that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the reasons that we've moved forward on some hearings to see if there isn't something we can do to get this back in the middle someplace to continue to protect homeowners and property owners with their rights under the Fourth Amendment, but also assuring everybody that, that victims of domestic violence or battery or anything else that's going on, that, that public safety officers will still have some options to make some decisions. I was always led to believe uh, that if there was a possible threat of somebody being injured, somebody's safety was in danger, um, that the police had the right to, uh, it's like the hot pursuit law, right. to say, hey, we're, we got to go check this out. Yeah. There's imminent danger there. Yeah. It's just like in, in certain instances in the law, uh, you can't use hearsay mm -hmm. except for urgent utterance. Absolutely, you can't speculate. Right. So, you know, if, if there's somebody getting beat up in somebody's house, business, or something like mm -hmm. that, and the police have uh, uh, reasonable uh, belief that there's something like this going on, they can barge right in yeah. and take care of business. Yeah, and and they should be able to. And, and you're right, as you well know, so many times victims of domestic violence, for whatever the reason is, and usually it's fear mm -hmm. of further abuse, they may change their mind by the time you, you arrive on the scene. Mm -hmm. And they change their mind because they're fearful of what's going to happen next after you leave. So the best idea to them is to do nothing. Well. That really puts you, as a public safety officer, in a horrible position because you're sitting here knowing or believing that this person has been a victim of domestic violence, maybe just a few minutes before you arrived on the scene. You turn around and drive away, what happens next? Or the next time you get called out there, is it a murder scene? Or is it even worse? Mm -hmm. So you've got, to have, you've got to have that flexibility to be able to do your job. Absolutely. But they're also... And, and under the Barnes versus the state and everything that we tried to do, there's got to be a clear understanding that you do have protection under the Fourth Amendment to protect your home and, and your property. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it has to be a clear definition. Now, I personally don't believe that my rights are being violated if I'm the uh, culprit that's creating the domestic violence issue. Uh, once I start breaking the law, whatever that law is, I think my rights go someplace over here. Mm -hmm. But there still has to be that clear definition somewhere or another when it's not that, that protects you as a public safety officer when you're trying to do your job and you're trying to do it exactly the way that you've been taught to do it but also protects a homeowner that is simply wanting to protect his home. Right. And that's, that's, uh, that's and I, the And I can see you know. what you're saying because, like, in a situation where, okay, this has started, uh, the victim has called 911, and um, say the police show up, the victim then says, no, I just overreacted. Yeah. And the police say, hey, we want to come in and see what's happened here. Yeah. Talk to everybody. Right, right. And, you know, and, and as you say, you know, domestic uh, calls are some of the worst oh, police can handle. They're probably the toughest call you make. You know, back you, in the day yeah. in the uniform, I've yeah. seen pe the uh, women who are victims actually turn on the police. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, say, and, and you know that those, those are some of the most violent 
uh, uh, emergency issues you'll respond to. Mm -hmm. And they're some of the toughest because you have to react just like that and, 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 and try to make the right decision to protect everybody, including yourself. And mostly when police show up, they say, and I, I think I, I remember how this all got started, when police would show up and say, we want to come in and look around. Well, most people mm -hmm. would say, okay. Mm -hmm. But I guess there's cases where they say, no, you can't yeah. come in. This is my house, you can't come yeah. in. And therefore, this was pushed into this law. Here. Yeah, yeah. And the, the law that uh, we created, and I, I believe it was in 2006, seven, somewhere back in there, we had debated it a couple years, and, and, uh, and, and we thought we had a pretty good thorough debate on it because it was a very bipartisan bill at the end of the day on how it was created, and it, and it gave under our Fourth Amendment and what it did is it, it just uh, re-empowered that, for lack of a better word, that you have certain rights on how to protect your home and your property mm -hmm. and that. And, and you should have. Uh, again, t to me, where it really gets tough is on domestic violence crimes and that. And, and, and again, going back to the victims. And, and you know through your history, Roger, I know of cases where the perpetrator on the victim has went to safe houses and talked them out of the safe house mm -hmm. to come home with them. They'll never do it again. And five or six hours later, the police are back out there and the victim is darn near beaten to death, mm -hmm. you know, or even worse. And, uh, and it Well, may my own daughter was a victim of sure. domestic abuse yeah. and it didn't end well. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very attuned to that. And the thing about it is, you know, I guess what we're looking at here, and it's good that you guys are having these hearings, is where do you draw the line on yeah. that? Yeah. Because as anything, it can be abused. Sure. You know, uh, if you say, with a 911 call for domestic violence, if somebody says you can't come in their door, right. you can go in anyway. Okay, that's one thing. But if it's a blanket effect, yeah. and we take away the Fourth Amendment, search and seizure, then and it's like a police state. Yeah, they, and they, there's already yeah. one sheriff yeah. uh, in northern part of the state that says, oh, I applaud that. We can get a lot yeah. of stuff off the street. We can just start going door to door and going in people's homes. You can't do that. That is like martial law. Yeah. That's a police and, state. And we don't want a police state. No, we don't. And, and I can assure you. We the damn general, sure don't. The General Assembly does not want a police state either. And, and of course, that's the reason that we filed the amicus brief. And that's the reason we're having uh, these study committees. It's, uh, it's such a tough line to get these things back into the middle. And, and you know, I was just out at the uh, Suzanne Gratian Center last Saturday. They had the free fair, and, and you know, they have a great program out there that was put together by our, our former prosecutor, Mark McKinney, to uh, uh, protect children and that and interview them with the proper way and everything. And, uh, you know, uh, we have dozens of children every day that are victims of domestic violence and uh, sexual abuse. And if you're the police officer showing up there, you know, the last thing in the world that you want to do is turn away and walk away from that home if you know there's something wrong going on in there with the child or whoever it is. But uh, golly, you know, there's there's got to be some way to get this into the middle to where it's not a gray area and we don't have a Supreme Court that's going to overreach in such a, a a much overreaching, I don't want to say silly, but it's our, our Supreme Court, but sometimes they do silly things. You uh, think? Yeah, well, and, and this is one of them. Uh, do you, what, what's the chances, you think, of getting this into the common sense area where it should be? I think there's a very good chance. Uh, I think at, at the first meeting, there was a lot of vetting by both sides of this that, that care deeply. The people that care deeply about their Fourth Amendment rights, but also uh, police officers and former police officers, and there's a former police officer that's a, a state representative that serves on the committee. And uh, you know, her biggest concern was that it was a 911 call that came in on domestic violence, and how do you tell those police officers to not do their job? So uh, I think once we get through all the vetting. And you know, and you have that a lot of times on these types of issues. That the I think that the uh, the legislators 
and the legal people that are, that are involved in this and this study committee, I think that they'll find something somewhere that will bring this back to the middle and just simply get back to the protection under the Fourth Amendment that people are entitled to, but maybe something that's written a little bit clearer that will give police officers and public safety officers the uh, uh, confidence that they can still do their job and protect the people that they're sworn to serve. Can I make a suggestion there? <laughs> I'm always open to suggestions, absolutely. Well, you know, as you probably know, there's in Delaware County, if in probably other counties now, but I do know for sure in Delaware County because I have judges come over here and mm -hmm. do shows and keep people updated about what's going on in the uh -huh. justice system. They have, like, if somebody is caught possibly driving impaired, mm -hmm. uh, DUI, drunk driving, whatever, and if they say, no, I refuse the breathalyzer test, mm -hmm. they could simply call one of these judges, uh, Marianne Voorhees, uh, uh, John Fike, mm -hmm. uh, one, one of the circuit court judges, and say, you know, here's the situation we have. Mm -hmm. They f have a fax machine in their homes, mm -hmm. and they fax a, a, a search warrant, if you will, and they take them to the hospital and draw their blood. Right. No if and buts about right. it. You, you uh, refuse a breathalyzer, you're going to get your blood drawn mm -hmm. by order of a judge. Yeah, one way Why way. can't we have judges on standby on domestic calls and have that same reaction and say, we've got a situation here. Mm -hmm. The woman is, is called 911. Uh, she was saying she's getting beat up. We've got here, she's recanted. I think she's afraid. Mm -hmm. We need an order to go in and uh, mm -hmm. look things over. That's a good point. You know, and, and that may end up what the decision is. It comes out of the, the study committee. And I'm sure if there's a, uh, a bipartisan solution that comes out of that study committee, that uh, there will be a piece of legislation dealing with that next year. The, I guess just being the devil, devil's advocate on this, uh, my biggest concern on that would be the timeline, is if, uh, if you're the judge and we can't get a hold of you and we're, we're there in the front yard, if we can't get a hold of you uh, for whatever the reason is, you know, what do we do next and what do we do next? And then when is there a, a timeline that you feel like you've got to make a decision? You know, I, I'm sure you, you've been in SWAT training issues and that on hostage situations and everything. There's got to come a time sometime or another uh, based on what your intelligence is that you're getting on the type of situation that it is that we've got to make a decision. Mm -hmm. We can't wait any longer. And I don't want to take that away from a police officer to have that ability to do that. But I also don't want them using the rights that we give them under a sworn oath that they take to protect and serve that they overreach, just like I think the Supreme Court has. And because you don't want them to come in to this building right here where we're filming at today, because it's your, your property, that you should have the right to tell them no. And if they don't like that, then let them go get a search warrant. Mm -hmm. If there's no threat of any imminent danger to myself or somebody else that's in here with you, then let them go get a search warrant. Well, the biggest fear, Dennis, is the uh, fear of uh, it being abused by right. police, law enforcement to say, I don't like that guy, or I think this guy's doing this and that, and just no, no knock, no mm -hmm. search warrants going yeah. into people's homes, yeah. Yeah. and that's the biggest fear that uh, some of the police, most of the police I know, and the general public that know about this has, and people who have studied the Constitution sure. and, and the Fourth Amendment for years, and, and the question is, well, when does our Bill of Rights get overrode by the state Supreme Court? Yeah, and, that, and that's a legitimate question. 
And that's exactly why we filed the amicus brief. We felt like the Supreme Court really overreached in their decision, and that's the reason that, that we're having hearings. I would have liked to have been appointed to that summer study committee, but the uh, Transportation and Infrastructure uh, Committee that I'm serving on sort of trumped it because we've got a lot of important issues to deal with in that. But uh, that's exactly where it falls at, Roger. That's exactly where it falls at. Well, what do, you, what do you suggest people do at this point? I mean, I know they're having the hearings. Yeah. And I and think there's a number of things that they can do. One is every state legislator in the House of Representatives and the Senate has contact phone numbers. Uh, I have my home phone number on all of my material. My home phone number is also in the book. If they have a belief in that one way or the other, take the time to share it with their legislators. Every, every citizen in the state of Indiana that uh, uh, resides here has a state representative and a state senator that's in their district. Take the time to let them know how they feel about this issue. Let them know that people care. If they don't want to call them on the telephone, send them a letter. If they don't want to send them a letter, send them an email. Mm -hmm. But let people know what they believe in and how they believe in it. And you know, reasonable people can come to a reasonable solution on this, and I think they will. And uh, uh, now you mentioned a while ago, if it comes to bipartisan uh, solution, I, hopefully that's not even a factor. I don't think it will be. I, uh, I'm a good example myself and other colleagues on in our, my Democrat caucus has supported this legislation from the implementation of it back when we first put the legislation together to protect people under their Fourth Amendment rights on search and seizure. Uh, it's the Supreme Court, after this Baker case, that has trumped everything that we did. And, uh, uh, and that's why we're coming back now to try and fix it, because I sincerely doubt if the Supreme Court will back up on, on what their decision is. However, I mean, nothing's impossible, but you know, sometimes when people put that black robe on, they, they think a little bit differently on uh, changing things in that. So that's another issue. Somebody once said there's a, they're one of the people you don't argue with that puts a dress on every day to go to work. It's a judge. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. But hopefully yeah. our, uh, now when people get a hold of their state reps, mm -hmm. uh, senators, uh, what do what's the the short version of what do they call this when they say hey I'm uh, against or I'm for I think the easiest thing to do is if, if you're my state legislator and I just call you and say hey Roger hi I'm Dennis Tyler I'm a constituent of yours and I'd just like you to know that I support the uh, legislation that was introduced protecting my Fourth Amendment rights and I hope that you would support that also and I know and I understand that there's a study committee going on particularly to addressing that and I would hope that you would support those issues if you look at it the other way you would simply call and just say the opposite mm -hmm. you know and say hey I support the Supreme Court ruling and, and I would hope that it that, that everything stays intact as a Supreme Court rule you know and uh, uh, I, I make it a habit to listen to my constituents that, that's uh, I make a, a habit to do that and there was many of my constituents that when we was putting this legislation together uh, a few years ago that were very adamant on what they they thought we should do and how we should do it and we crafted that legislation almost exactly like people across the state of Indiana believed that it should be crafted. So how did it get per perverted into this? The Barnes versus the state case and it and and it got sent to the Supreme Court because the, uh, the uh, gentleman sued over it and filed the charges and filed the civil complaints and everything as he can do and uh, it ended up and went through the court process and ended up in the Supreme Court's hands and they uh, they ruled that uh, police officers have the complete right for search and seizure hmm. that's overreaching it is and um, you know it's just like a lot of people think that police want that or want a police state and that's not the case uh, a lot of people think police want gun control. Well, most police that I know, um, they want—they don't want 
convicted felons to have guns. Sure, sure. And but, it, nobody does. But, you know, as far as your uh, law-abiding citizen, especially if they take the time to get trained sure. to properly use them, get a permit and all that, they, they don't have sure. a problem with that. Oh, no. And a lot of police officers I know are members of the NRA. So, sure. you know, police get a bad rap on this sure. sometimes. But, you know, just because one sheriff of northern Indiana thinks this is good legislation, Good. We take away their Fourth Amendment rights. We can go in. Yeah. We can go door to door on people's well, homes. That's you know, ludicrous. People don't get elected and get a mandate from being elected to be a bully and take advantage of their position. You know that should never happen. And uh, everything that I've heard about this sheriff's comments up up north is that's almost exactly the way it looks like it. He's wanting to portray this thing. And I can do whatever I want to now and, mm -hmm. and shame on everybody else and. and 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 that shouldn't just shouldn't be that way, you know. I uh, uh, I I support the NRA's uh, stands on on probably 99 percent of their issues, and I support it on this one. You know as well as I do, the no police officer ever wants to get called out on a domestic violence call because nothing good comes out of mm -hmm. it, and they know it, and they hate them. They they hate them. They wish that they would never get called out on one. Yeah. Years ago, training in the shoot no shoot scenarios, uh, ones that usually tripped you up was the domestic violence calls. Yeah, you're yeah. you're going after uh, and and you know they got them on these big screens mm -hmm. and uh, interactions and you're you're concentrating on the yeah. uh, alleged perpetrator. And yeah. then next thing you know, the wife is giving you a skillet upside oh, yeah. the head or yeah. shooting you, stabbing you or something sure. and all that. You're right. I mean, yeah. that's one of the worst calls oh, yeah. that you can and, get. And then, if, and then if you turn around and walk away and it escalates into something even more violent, you're probably going to end up in a civil suit. Oh, yeah. You're probably going to end up getting sued. You know? And, well, and, look what's happened up in gas. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just... Uh, uh, it, there's no good solution to it, and that's why most of us in the General Assembly, our argument has been, you know, you got to get this thing back and focus a little bit on on what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. And uh, I haven't heard anybody tell me that they didn't believe that the Supreme Court overreached in their their reaction to this mm -hmm. in the way that they uh, they ruled on it. Uh, and do you know the judge's name that? Uh, I believe it was Shepard that, that wrote the brief on it, I believe, yeah. So that's the one when voting time comes, should we retain <laughs> the Supreme well, Court judge uh, I, that we take yeah. it? Good. And, and again, you know, <laughs> most of the problem is most of the time people don't uh, pay a lot of attention to that at the back, should we retain or not retain. Oh, I, I because work, they don't know much about them. Right, they don't. Yeah. And, and because of that, I usually say, no, don't retain them. Yeah. Yeah. And there is, you know, and there's some people that do that, but there's probably some people that do just the opposite yeah. too. But it's uh, you I, never hardly hear of Supreme no. Court judges. Yeah, yeah. But I, I believe, I believe that's who it is. He and he is the chief Supreme Court Shepherd, justice. Remember yeah. that. And I believe, Shepherd, like I believe, the sheep herder. Uh, now don't hold me to it. Uh, <laughs> you may want to go double check it. But I, I believe that that is who, who wrote the, the uh, uh, ruling brief on it. So we suggest you get a hold of your uh, state representatives and state senators and let them know how you feel yes. on this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And again, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people sometimes don't know what's going on. They haven't heard. Sure. Some do. I know they had a rally at the state house, uh, what, a couple months yes. ago? Yes. And that was leading into the first hearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and it's good. It's good to do that in a very peaceful way. Mm -hmm. Again, it's that's that's always good. That's that's another part of our rights that that we should never ever allow to be taken away from. Lawful assembly. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm a firm believer in the Constitution and our First Amendment, or all of our amendments, I Bill of Rights, and um, you know, taking an oath two or three times to, yeah. to protect them. Absolutely. And uh, this is one that I feel is really getting stepped on yeah. here. Well, you know, uh, when you're sworn into the General Assembly, you take an oath to uh, protect that and, and the rules and laws in the state of Indiana. And so are those judges. Abs yeah, absolutely they do. Absolutely they do. They, they forgot what they've learned in yeah. law school, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Well, sometimes, you know, uh, 
something gets in the way of common sense sometimes. And sometimes it takes something like this to bring things back into perspective. And uh, I think that that's where we're getting. Uh, and I can't help but believe that something will come out of this committee. And even if nothing comes out of this committee, I can guarantee you there'll probably, if there, nothing comes out of this committee, the, the good part about it is, is if something comes out of the committee, it'll have to come out in a bipartisan way, which will make that legislation much simpler to pass as it's crafted and heads through the General Assembly next year. If they can't come to some sort of resolution on it, uh, on what they need to do and how they need to do it, Roger, I can almost assure you that there will be legislation moving from both sides of the General Assembly, the Senate and the House next year, and uh, to try and deal with this. But the best way to deal with it would be if, if they could come up with something out of this study committee that everybody can sign off on. And usually when that happens, it's a, a pretty simple process to get it through the, the House and the Senate to the Governor's office for his signature. Well, I have common sense, and uh, our rights are definitely yeah. getting stepped yeah. on here. Uh, this issue and the issue that was so silly that, that happened last year where uh, even people over 65 years of age had to be carded when they went into a liquor store for carry out or that, those were two of the most phoned-in issues to my home that I can remember in a long time. Yeah, And both of them should have been. That one was silly, the way that... that uh, the law was interpreted, and we went in and fixed that, and I think we'll go in and fix this, too. Um, on another note, before we run out of time, is there anything else that uh, is very prevalent uh, that uh, is going on in the... Oh, there's a, there's a lot of labor issues being discussed right now. Uh, I just got the latest update on the calendar. I believe there's a hearing next week on employment issues. I'm sure uh, right to work and some of the... Uh, uh, issues on the common construction wage and the bidding process and, and a lot of that is going to be dealt with. Uh, I'll be serving on an unemployment committee hearing uh, in October. What's week. going on with that now? I know uh, a couple of years ago uh, I was with a bunch of folks. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the state house packed yeah. on the unemployment issue. What's going on with that? Well, as you know, they uh, uh, this last session, they legislation was passed cutting unemployment benefits 25 percent across the board to uh, people on unemployment which took their unemployment compensation uh, insurance down to about two hundred and twenty dollars a week wow. is the maximum that they could draw I'm glad That's I retired. the average yeah <laughs> yeah and and that that kicked in and really hurt and and, uh, uh, and there's some other criteria that was written into the unemployment bill on how uh, uh, people don't qualify or do qualify and uh, a question about seasonal workers and how uh, teachers yeah, how, and how's that come about? Well, uh, a lot of that will be decided in this uh, next session. Uh, yeah, in, in something will, I'm sure will come out of the, the study committee but I doubt if it will come out in a bipartisan way. I mean, there, there's Probably a pretty not. strong disagreement between the two caucuses on, on how that, that should be uh, judged and uh, there, was, there was a change in the uh, ruling and, and the rules on the uh, compensation on taking it now on a yearly basis instead of the way that it had been broke up on, on so, many, so many weeks prior to your unemployment uh, which drives down the unemployment compensation even further and the tough part about that is for a lot of people was uh, at the same time that we was driving that down uh, for people that are on unemployment that needed that money to uh, maybe hold on to their homes or you know put food on their table is that uh, that same bill gave a billion dollars in uh, tax breaks to, to businesses over the next five years and, and uh, nobody was against helping businesses in that but what I was trying to put into place with some legislation that I had was uh, rewarding the businesses that weren't laying people off with mm -hmm. those tax breaks and uh, that made a lot more sense to me. Encouraging them to keep people working. Yes, yeah. And uh, we didn't get very far with that. And uh, Why is it that the people who go out here and bust their butts and work for a living is the one that gets trumped on? Well, sometimes they don't have as much of a voice in representation in Indianapolis or in Washington. And I think you've seen that a lot over the last few years. Uh, as they should have, and uh, 
and there's a lot of people that don't even really understand it to be honest with you uh, you know a lot of people can't relate to two hundred and twenty dollars a week they think that's a pretty good income and for a family of four you know it's not no. and, uh, and when by any stretch of the imagination right and, and when people are unemployed it's usually going to cost you more and uh, that unemployment cut in the city of Muncie cost us about $15 million a year in uh, revenue coming into our community that, that those unemployed workers would have put back into our community in a lot of ways. So, I mean, it, it, uh, it's, a, it's a tough issue and, it, and it's a battle of philosophies, you know, and it's, it's a direct battle of philosophies. You know, since I was 17 years old, I've been in the workforce. Mm -hmm. I worked construction. I worked in Chevrolet Muncie, mm -hmm. uh, General Motors in uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, I've paved, built a lot of the roads here in Delaware County, yeah. and most of them in Madison and other counties. Yeah. And you know, you you work hard all summer. You try to save some money when you can. You get laid off in the winter. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen. Sure. And um, especially in Indiana. Mm -hmm. And then you know you you get unemployment, but you've paid into it. Your employers paid into it, and then you got all these other people um, that are getting Social Security or mm -hmm. welfare and things like this that haven't paid into the system. And what really gets me is as bad as this country is off, I, and I heard this uh, a couple weeks ago, you know, you hear our uh, national government say, oh my God, we're, we're trying to put a ceiling on the mm -hmm. national debt. But we're giving a hundred and three million dollars to some world third world country because mm -hmm. they need some help. Yeah. Don't we need the help? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it, it you know, it bothers me when we're having more and more food banks well, uh, yeah. that are uh, running out of their surpluses and that they need to provide to people. And. Uh, and it's pretty amazing if you ever went to one of those food pantry lines and looked. Uh, you see a lot of people showing up there in, in uh, uh, that three years ago were maybe making fifty and sixty and seventy thousand dollars a year. Absolutely. And now they've lost their job uh, and close to losing everything they've got, and they're in a they're, they're in a food line and. Uh, and the reality is that, uh, you know, the numbers will show you, if you're out of work for six months, you're probably not going to get a job. Most places, uh, unless you're in some sort of training program and in school, uh, the studies will show that you're probably not going to get hired. And, uh, and that's really too bad. And, you know, that's why we've put our, together our TAA programs and our other training programs to try and get people re-educated and educated to where they, they can roll back into the workforce if and when we can ever get jobs into our communities that uh, uh, can give them an opportunity to provide a living for, for them and their families. And, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough time right now to think about what's happening to those types of people. And a lot of what you see is people are so wrapped up in keeping themselves above water that they don't think about the other guy like they used to, you know, years and years ago when our parents were coming up and others, and and, uh, and they always made sure that everybody in their neighborhood was okay and, and mm -hmm. different things and looked out for well, each other. Well, it's every man for himself now. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, this is, you could say this is a national issue, but, you know, you're with the state government, so we'll make it a state issue. And even more locally, we'll make it a Muncie, Delaware County issue. The There's people who want to work. Sure. That's... Uh, worked all our lives sure. that are out of jobs here. Sure. All of our manufacturing is gone. Sure. Our infrastructure is breaking down yeah. here. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, uh, there's no construction work hardly yeah. at all in Muncie, yeah. Delaware County. Yeah. Uh, when you, as I retired early, because I knew all this was coming, mm -hmm. and, you know, I've I've paid into that retirement for years and years, which is another issue. Mm -hmm. When the government says, well, your uh, social security and 
entitlement and all this. No, I'm not entitled. No. I, I'm entitled to it because I paid it. into it. Yeah, you earned it. You earned it. You know, yeah. it, I didn't. You know, they're not no. giving me nothing. No, I, I can't even right. get it yet. No, I absolutely. hope it's there when I can. Yeah. I, I, but I'm retired out of my union. Now, having said that, I can work 40 hours a month, mm -hmm. not a minute over, 40 hours a month out of my union. Mm -hmm. But you know where I'm set? Anytime I go out on an out-of-work board, mm -hmm. within 48 hours, because I'm on the A-list, because you know I've been in the union so long, right. I get called out. It's mm -hmm. usually in Marion County, Hamilton County. Yeah. That's the closest. Because there's no work around yeah, here. I know. And uh, see, you, you really touched on something there that means a lot to me, and that's rebuilding our infrastructure. Yes. I think that is so critical into it's re apart. revitalizing not just Muncie and Delaware <clears throat> County, but our entire state. And when you do that, you, you accomplish a lot of things. And especially if you start from the underground up, is that you're creating decent jobs. Mm -hmm. And every one of them decent jobs usually trickles over into another one and a half or two jobs. Mm -hmm. So I believe that you, and if you look at the, the communities that are really have a lot going on in positive ways on job growth, people wanting to move in, are the communities that have a strong infrastructure program Absolutely. going on, great parks programs, uh, and good school systems in mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And there's so many good people out there ready and willing to go to work. And I can give you one example of a lady that worked at Borg Warner, Roger. She's got two engineering degrees and she cannot find a job. My God. She's either overqualified or she's underqualified. But she, she was an engineer at Borg Warner. Her son's an honor student at Wilson Middle School and they're on, he's on free and reduced lunch. She can't keep her head above water, you know, and uh, and, uh, and she's ready and willing to go to work. Yeah. yeah. Well, it just seems like the people, to me, and and I'm not making a social statement out of this by any stretch of imagination, but it bothers me. It bothers millions and millions of other people. There's mm -hmm. people able, willing, ready to go to work. Yeah. All they want is a fair day's pay for a fair day's yeah. work. Yeah. And then you got people who has no inclination whatsoever to go yeah. to work. Yeah. It seems like, okay, they get taken care of. They don't help the infrastructure. Yeah. They don't, it, you know, and all that stuff should be a safety net. Sure. But as you know, there's people, that's their lifestyle. Oh, sure. And sure. I think that, you know, if you can work, try to get a mm -hmm. job. But you're, you're exactly right. Our infrastructure is falling apart. Muncie's infrastructure is falling apart. Mm -hmm. When when I do get sent to other counties to work, mm -hmm. I mean, Carmel, Fishers, sure. Pendleton, sure. You know, Indianapolis. I mean, they're constantly building an yeah. infrastructure. They have. Yeah. They get it. Things going on there. Yeah. They, they, they get, get that money yeah, to they do, do that. And they get it. They they know that that's important. It, and you mentioned Hamilton County, and it's interesting because just three weeks ago I was looking at a study, and Hamilton County I think is now the, the fifth most attractive county in the nation. I believe it. Not in Indiana, in the nation. I believe it. On job attraction, and job creation, and retention. Mm -hmm. And when you look at what their top reasons are, and what they gave was they have a strong public school system, they have a great parks program that they're utilizing, and the way that they're rebuilding their infrastructure. They're not doing it after the fact, they're doing it before the fact, and they're out front. So when a company wants to look at locating there, they've got everything ready in, in place for them to where they can have things up and moving for them in 72 to 96 hours to two weeks and have them starting to get in place to, to having the building occupied or whatever they need to do. And that's what you've got to do. You know, you've got to be very proactive, and that that was one of the reasons. Just uh, two years ago, my caucus put together a hundred million dollar project that would go back into infrastructure, nothing but infrastructure. Every bit of that would have went into infrastructure, and eighty percent of the people working on those projects would have had to have been Hoosiers. They couldn't have came from Ohio. They couldn't have came from Kentucky. They couldn't come from Michigan. They couldn't come from Illinois. They had to come from Indiana. Good for them. And every the way that we we calculated it, every city and county would have simply recovered in that two year period the money that they were losing under the way that the uh, uh, they had rewritten the revenue funding formula under the Motor Vehicle Highway Fund. 
which would have given, I believe, Muncie and Delaware County about $30 million over two years, which would have been, you know, a heck of a shot in the arm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because now we're clawing for many. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we got a lot to to do, but hopefully that uh, that's what a lot of people want to see. I mean, you, you can't have people who are building your infrastructure mm -hmm. getting uh, shorted right. here by the government right. because they're simply going to either work, look at yeah. other trades or, or work, right. different kind of work, or go somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's places you can go uh, outside of Indiana that you absolutely get paid more. Yeah. Well, you know, most of our building trades people in Delaware County are now traveling. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they have they're, to. They're working, but they're traveling to do it. They have to. And some people say, well, that's okay. Well, it's okay if you're not the one doing the traveling. <laughs> yeah, it's okay yeah. if you're not paying $4, yeah. uh, and a, $4 gallon a gallon for gas. For gas, absolutely. Which is another yeah. big pet peeve with a lot oh, of boy. people. <laughs> yeah, it should be. Yeah, the speculators are just killing us. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're about to run out of time, but I'm glad you came in and well, talked about you, these things. And this uh, Fourth Amendment um, uh, bill is a very important bill for Absolutely. people in Indiana that they need to wake up yeah. and get involved in. They should. They should. Because we don't want this to become a police no, state. No, we don't. No, they need to contact their legislators and let them know how they feel. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Doug. Thank you. Thanks Appreciate for coming it, in. And thank you again for watching Community Focus. Tune in again next time. Community Focus would like to thank the following underwriters for their help and support with our production. Hi, I'm Jen Schultz. I'm the new owner of Cheers. We're a proud underwriter of Community Focus. We're open and ready for business. Hey guys, my name is Leah. I work here at Cheers Tavern. Come check out our great people and our great food. Our address is 3823 North Broadway Avenue, Muncie, Indiana. Hometown Outdoor Advertising Incorporated, Muncie, Indiana. Put your business up for everyone to see. Wishbone Gifts Incorporated, corner of Walnut, and Jackson Street in Muncie, Indiana. Best Built Computers, more than 25 years of computer repair experience. 413 South Tillotson Avenue, Suite 1, 765-216-6701 or 765-216-6041. Muncie Crime Stoppers, if you see something, say something. Elm Ridge Funeral Home and Memorial Park, 4600 West Kilgore Avenue, Muncie, Indiana, 765-288-5061. Visit our website, www.elmridgefuneralhome.com. We also offer certified celebrants. Tim Clevenger, Heating and Cooling, 288-2773. 2713 East Jackson Street, Muncie. Community Focus is produced by Millennium Productions Incorporated. Thank you for watching.